Hi, I'm Matthew Cook, a postgraduate student currently studying with the Centre for Post-Digital Cultures at Coventry University. And in this presentation, titled Drawing the Line in the LED, I'd like to explore the ways in which the smart city has pivoted from its original intended goals of creating an inclusive, efficient and intelligent city space designed for the people who live in it, uh, and instead has now become a testbed for technologies most of which are entirely aimed at the extraction and sale of data for profit. Uh, I'd also like to discuss the ways in which this change has come about, where it can be seen most prominently, specifically through a project that's still running in New York City, and if this really has to be the way that the smart city continues to develop itself. The smart city is a concept that relies on the collection and analysis of data through specifically designed technology, in order to create insights about various aspects of city life. Traffic, energy efficiency, street lighting, even home living. Uh, in the smart city, everything becomes connected through these smart technologies in order to create a network of connected sensors that people are able to interface with uh, and be provided insights into all aspects of daily life. Existing technology like smartphones, smart watches, smart home assistants, all of these have become pretty integral to this concept because they act as an interface into this connected network. And on paper it seems pretty idyllic, uh, but let's take a look at New York City and the Link NYC project in order to see how the smart city can really pan out in practice. In the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy in 2012, citizens of New York were left without access to mobile networks or internet. Communication with friends, family, and insurance firms based outside of the city became extremely difficult. And at this time, the main form of communication infrastructure remaining was the old public pay telephones. These pay phones became a lifeline for many New Yorkers, and in this time of crisis, their usefulness became extremely apparent. Even with handheld digital devices becoming redundant, the pay phones of New York could still operate. Timing was everything in this situation, as the contracts that New York City had made with the telephone companies who were paid to maintain and operate the public pay telephone services were expiring in 2014. This meant that these telephone companies were gifted a fair amount of leverage in negotiation with new contracts with New York City. However, instead of entering negotiation, Mayor Blumberg announced in 2013 that the city would hold a public contest to design and pitch an alternative to the public pay telephone system marking the first exploration of this idea, with various unique prototype images emerging from the competition. On November 17, 2014, the new mayor, Bill de Blasio, released a statement announcing that New York City would in fact be moving away from traditional public pay telephone systems. Instead, they would create a network of advanced kiosks in place of existing telephones that would establish a free public Wi-Fi network spearheaded by an initiative called Link NYC. These kiosks would also offer charging stations, touchscreen displays, and free nationwide cooling. Link NYC would be financially backed by a consortium called CityBridge, consisting initially of a collection of public and private companies. The ones to be most aware of for now are Titan Outdoor and Control Group. Titan Outdoor had previously been involved in the rollout of outdoor advertising on vehicles, stations, payphone kiosks, and street banners in New York. And a month prior to the announcement of the Link NYC project, Titan Outdoor had also faced heavy criticism. It had been found that they had been installing hundreds of beacons into the physical payphone casings. These beacons are tiny radio transmitters that can be used to push digital advertising to phones, as well as track the physical location of mobile devices. While they had done so with the blessing of the city, there had been no public notice, consultation, or approval. Mired in controversy, Titan was now in charge of advertising through Link NYC's citywide Wi-Fi network as well. While not as controversial, Control Group was the company tasked with the design, production and deployment of these innovative new kiosks. It's also at this time that Mayor de Blasio would begin to heavily lean on the idea of bridging the digital divide as a form of justification for this new system. So let's pause for a minute and discuss this digital divide, because it's pretty core to everything that's going to unfold in the coming years. The digital divide is a term coined by Lloyd Morissette. At the time, they were the leader of the Markle Foundation, a foundation which investigates potential public problems in technology, healthcare, and national security. 
The term refers to a growing disparity between the privileged and underprivileged, specifically discussing the contrasting ability to access the internet and other digital services. Households without access to broadband could be found primarily in neighbourhoods of boroughs such as the Bronx and Queens, where families with lower average incomes reside. Not having access to digital services can be a huge disadvantage for people trying to individually develop new skills, access additional educational resources, or attempting to find steady work in office positions that rely on experience with specific softwares. Mayor de Blasio's referencing of the digital divide was valid. A report filed by the New York City Comptroller in 2014 found that 27% of all New York City households do not have access to home broadband, a number that jumped to 34% in the Bronx and 26% in Queens. Some districts within the boroughs were also much worse off than others. Borough Park, Kensington and Ocean Parkway were all areas where 47% of households lacked home broadband. And so the claim that Link NYC could bridge the digital divide was not entirely unfounded. The installation of public citywide Wi-Fi could theoretically improve home access to the internet without the need for individual homeowners to be subscribed to a dedicated broadband package. The promise, if fulfilled, could be genuinely life-changing for a lot of people. By June of 2015, only a year into the project, Link NYC was about to be faced with significant change. Google had announced on June 11th, 2015, that they would be establishing a new company named Sidewalk Labs, aimed to improve cities through data. And on June 23rd, Sidewalk Labs announced the acquisition of two companies, Titan Outdoor and Control Group, both of which were heavily involved with the Link NYC project. The two companies merged into a company called Intersection, which would be bought under the Sidewalk Labs umbrella. This acquisition tied Google and Sidewalk Labs directly into the Link NYC project. This also meant that Sidewalk Labs would receive a share of the ad revenue that Link NYC would generate, a figure that Mayor de Blasio stated could be in excess of $500 million over the course of the next 12 years. The estimation was that by summer of 2015, there would be a total of 500 kiosks or links as they would begin to refer to them. They would be active and ready for use, and they would pave the way for 4,000 additional links to be created within the following four years. By the time the project had fully rolled out, it was estimated that there could be around 10,000 links in total. The expected launch date came and went, and on January 5th, 2016, New York City unveiled two links, both of which were not fully functional and had also both been constructed in Manhattan, marking the start of an extremely challenging rollout for Link NYC. The project as a whole would progress much, much slower than anticipated, as the links became fully functional, complete with touchscreen internet browsing capability, problems began to arise. Walking the streets of Manhattan, uptown or downtown, you're bound to see people making themselves right at home at these Link NYC kiosks. And plugging in for extended periods of time is something we also noticed over and over the past few weeks. Day after day across the city, we documented many who appear to be homeless, camped out, connected to wires. Some New Yorkers first complained about the kiosks when they were rolled out in 2016. The free web browsing feature immediately became a tool to watch inappropriate content and loiter, forcing the city to remove the web browsing. Now the question, should the charging ports also be taken away? These issues of public response forced the project to a near halt as they began to work on solutions for inappropriate use of the links. By 2017, public opinion on the network continued to sour. The location of the links installation sometimes blocked home windows. The noise generated by phone calls and loitering would disturb locals. And two years away from their intended 4,000 link milestone, the project had only completed 920 links. The number, granted, would double by the fall of 2018, however, it would be at this point that the construction of new links would halt entirely. During the initial planning stages of the project, it was stated that 52% of all links distributed in New York City would be built in Manhattan. The other boroughs would have the remaining 48% split between them. With 1,800 links complete, and the majority of them being in Manhattan, the project was trending towards failure of its original goal trying to bridge the digital divide. But production of the links wasn't solely halted due to this failed promise. 
it began to emerge that CityBridge had drastically fallen behind on agreed payments with New York City due to a failing advertising revenue stream. CityBridge had frequently failed to make full payments. Even the initial 2015 revenue payment was short by 1.68 million, and a report filed by the New York City Comptroller found that an additional $60.3 million in revenue, as well as $8.63 million in interest, had accrued since September of 2018. The report continued to discuss these issues, recommending a higher level of month-to-month -month financial scrutiny for CityBridge. And in addition to this, the report highlighted a huge discrepancy in the coverage that the links actually offered. Where 92% of all New York City zip codes had access to paid public telephone services, the new agreement with Link NYC led to 46% of these zip codes having access to links. Another agreement that had been breached according to this report was the construction of five gigabit centers, which would act as city-backed community centers that had access to high-speed internet. It was found that the final email correspondence in regards to the gigabit centers had been sent in 2019, and as of July 2020, when the report was filed, there was still no progress towards the construction or the location of these centers. Other highlighted issues involved data privacy and City Bridge's violation of its own privacy policy, as well as fees accrued from public vandalism of the link screens. The report was pretty damning for the project, and in 2020 it was reported that there was serious consideration over the termination of this project. And so City Bridge began to pivot the Link NYC project, and instead of providing links, the project became focused on the construction of 32-foot tall towers named Link 5G Towers. These structures promised to provide wider spread 5G coverage to all boroughs of New York, while still operating with most of the functionality of the regular links. The difference is, these structures would allow other telecommunications companies to pay CityBridge to house their own 5G equipment inside the structure. A move made almost entirely to recoup the losses and pay outstanding fees to New York City. And that brings us to 2024. There's been increasing unrest about the ugliness of the Link NYC project, and there may be potential for yet another reboot or redesign of the project. At the heart of the controversy, the next generation 5G Link NYC transmission towers. That's one of them right there. You see it over the vehicle across the street, even with the third floor of that building. Yeah, that height, that size is getting some pushback. In April of 2024, Link NYC released a press release reporting that Link NYC had generated a total of $119 million in advertising revenue since the project's launch in 2016. This was still $400 million short of their initial projections with three years to go till their deadline. And on top of this, the same press release highlights that one in three households, or 29% of New York City households, lack broadband internet access. Staggeringly, the figure has actually increased since Mayor de Blasio's initial promise to bridge the digital divide in 2014 where an estimated 27% of households lacked broadband internet. And so I would argue that Link NYC, despite being the largest and fastest public government operated Wi-Fi network in the world, is a failure. And a failure that not only has become focused on recovering from a large scale financial setback, but one that has actually worked to worsen the quality of life for most of New York City's citizens. Poor development choices, frequent vandalism, loitering, the continued ostracizing of the homeless, and a failure to provide a service to the ones who need it most have all contributed to this. Underlined by a need to create a higher revenue stream, Link NYC has taken the route that majority of smart city technologies will have to eventually take. Revenue through digital advertising is reliant entirely on data, locational data, browsing data, app usage data, Anything that can be collected and distilled into an ideal customer profile that can help advertising companies to target their ideal audience is useful. Data, in a way, becomes the core of the smart city concept. Sensor technology designed with the idea of collecting and analyzing continually more specific aspects of daily life is what the smart city boils down to. The side effect is that these systems need to be financially viable for development, which is why the majority of smart city technology that's created begins to lean heavily into the collection of anonymized data for advertising purposes. 
Link NYC is a free public Wi-Fi network, which is a great concept on paper. Unfortunately, it needs to be paid for. So in exchange for free use, it collects various aspects of your data for sale. This approach to the collection and sale of data can be understood as a form of surveillance capitalism. Surveillance capitalism incentivizes the assignment of financial value to certain aspects of data, depending on who you are as an individual. For Link NYC, affluent individuals living in neighborhoods such as Manhattan potentially have more value to companies that are promoting high fashion, travel, and high-end commercial services. So placing 52% of all total links in Manhattan is a great way to capture an incredibly large amount of anonymized data on people who live in this area and who are potential customers. They may have more money to spend than others, they may spend more often than others, and they may use the web to browse these websites through the Link NYC service. In this regard, there's little incentive for a company looking to make $500 million in advertising revenue through the course of 12 years to make a free public Wi-Fi service and to plan it around people with less money to spend and who would therefore have less value to advertisers. The smart city has undoubtedly changed from its idyllic utopian imagery of unity and efficiency under technology. And unfortunately, there's little chance it will ever change back. The line has been drawn and the smart city, much like many other technological developments, has become less about who's best and rather who's first.